So remember the question Nina asked, oh, sorry, welcome back to Space Case Chapter 20. The question Nina asked yesterday was, computer, Nina demanded, where is Garth Grisson right now? Dismantling the airlock, the computer replied calmly. Everyone gasped in alarm. <gasps> Nina was the first to race out the door. The rest of us were right behind her. Stop right there, Mr. Gisson ordered. As the computer had stood, <clears throat> excuse me, as the computer had stood, he was standing by the main airlock. The control panel had been ripped off and the wires were dangling out of it. Mr. Gisson was wearing a full spacesuit, helmet and all. He no longer looked like the reserved meek man we knew. That had all been an act. The real Garth Brisson was a daunting presence with a cold look in his eye and a commanding voice. He warned, if anyone comes a step closer, I'll open both doors at once and depressurize the whole moon base. Which means everybody's dead. Except for Garth. That's not possible, Nina said. It is now, Mr. Gisson told her. I overrode the safety protocols. Although I won't do anything unless you force me to. He placed a thumb on the keypad and shook his head sadly. I was really hoping things wouldn't come to this. It was 25 feet to the airlock from where we all stood. There was nothing but open space in between us. There was no way to get ahead of Mr. Gisson. Nina raised her hand, signaling, signaling him to calm down as she edged closer to him. Take it easy. We should just stop reading right there for the day. No. No. Yeah, you, 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 you not there. You've been leaving it on cliffhangers this whole time. I know. Isn't it awesome? No. No, it is. <laughs> it is so awesome to leave it on. All right, shh, here we go. Stop, Mr. Grisson ordered. I'm not bluffing. Nina froze where she was. I noticed Zan Perfonic wasn't with us anymore. I had no idea how long she'd been gone or how much she'd witnessed in the control room. I could only hope that she was circling around to get the jump on Mr. Grisson somehow. What do you want from us, Dad asked. Your cooperation, Mr. Gisson replied. Unfortunately, you have all become privy to information that should have remained a secret. And I'm prepared to take drastic measures to make sure it goes no farther than this spot. Absolutely. He's going to try to find alien base. Well, right now he's threatening to kill them all, right? Really quick. Yep. Well, he is. We already figured that one out because he's spelled Garth, right? G A R T H in sign language. That's what Mr. Um, Dr. Holtz spelled. Ah, oh, Mr. Gasson is the murderer, but I think Zan is the alien. I'm sorry, say it one more time. Wasn't what? Yeah, so Zan would make sense, my friend, saying because Mr. Gisson, you said did or didn't? Yeah. 
Yeah, so she wasn't anywhere to be seen, and so he didn't catch her. Okay. Um, let's see. Are you crazy, Chang asked? If you open that airlock, you won't just kill us. You'll kill everyone here. Desperate times call for desperate measures, Mr. Gasson said calmly. There are forces at work here you don't understand. Then explain it to us, Mom pleaded. Why is it so important that no one learn that there has been alien contact? That's not the case, Mr. Gasson informed us. The right people can know about it. In fact, they should know about it. Dr. Holtz wouldn't listen to reason, though. He wanted to tell everyone. He wanted the whole world to know, and I knew I couldn't trust him to keep his mouth shut. Why can't the whole world know, I asked. Grover's Mill, Mr. Gasson said. Oh, come on, Chang groaned. You can't be serious. What's Grover's Mill, Kira asked. Chang started to explain when Mr. Gasson beat him to it. On October 13th, 1938, an actor named Orson Welles did a radio broadcast in which he reported that Martians had landed at Grover's Mill, New Jersey. And although Welles warned people before the broadcast that it was merely for entertainment, people who turned in during the middle of it believed it and they were terrified. There was a massive panic. So this actually happened. Orgy Wells wrote a story. And before there was TV, there was radio, right? So they could send radio signal out through the airways. People could catch, catch them with their radio things and then listen to the radio. It was a really popular pastime at night. I think Mr. Kemmler talked about that when we were at the Historical Museum. Every way you gather around the radio and listen to a story. Well... At the beginning of the radio story, he said, this is a fictional story or pretend story that I'm going to tell, okay? So if you listen at the beginning of the story, you knew it was fake. If you came in while the story was going on, all of a sudden you're like, oh, oh my word, did that really happen? And there was massive panic, okay? Today... If somebody was telling a story on TV, they could always run at the bottom. This is a fake story or something, right? Because they could scroll it and you would know. But on the radio, there was no way for them to interrupt. Well, they didn't interrupt because they started it out by saying this is a fake story. So it says there was a massive panic because in the story, the Martians were attacking Earth, Nina argued. And they were imaginary, Mr. Gasson shot back. Now think what will happen if the citizens of the world learn that real aliens were coming. The public is primed to think that aliens are dangerous. Even if you tell them this news you found come, comes in peace, they won't believe it. Frankly, I don't believe it. So that's what this is all about, Chang exclaimed. This isn't about real people at all. It's about you and all your fellow psychopaths at the Pentagon. You're the ones who are afraid. Mr. Grisson's brow furrowed in anger. You think that's foolish? You think an alien race is really going to come halfway across this galaxy just to make friends? That's not how the universe works, pal. The Europeans didn't sail across the ocean six centuries ago to make nice with the Native Americans. So we've been talking about the Native Americans, right? The Europeans go across the ocean. Were most of them kind to the Native Americans when they showed up? Sometimes they started out being nice, but eventually they took their land and they brought diseases and killed a lot of them, right? Um, and we learned about William Penn the other day, and William Penn actually paid the Native Americans. Did most people pay the Native Americans for their land? No. Um, they wiped them out and stole everything they had. 
and there's no reason to believe that another race would do any different. Of course there is, Chang protested. Just because humans are evil doesn't mean the rest of the galaxy is too. Fine, Mr. Gasson said dismissively. You can go right on believing life's just like E.T. When the aliens come, we'll all link arms and sing Kumbaya together. But my job is to prepare, be prepared for the alternative. Any life form from another planet is most likely hostile. And any contact they make with us, no matter how friendly it seems, is more likely a ruse or fake to learn our weaknesses. Wow, Chang gasped. Is everyone at the Pentagon such a paranoid whack job, or are you just special? Mom squeezed Chang's arm and said under her breath, Don't taunt him. Mr. Grissom was shaking his head and sneering at Chang with disgust. Dr. Holtz was just like you, a naive optimist, thinking his alien contact couldn't possibly be dangerous. So much that he was willing to give up his life for it. I gave that fool options. He could have turned over the alien to me, let me talk to them, and get a sense of their intentions. But rather than do that, he chose to force my hand. So you're th you threatened his family back on Earth, Dad asked. Told him you'd have them killed if he didn't go out the airlock. I wouldn't have had them killed, Mr. Grisson said. But you still threaten them, right? Mom demanded. Because that's what you do, isn't it? Threaten those who are weaker than you. You sent that text to Dashiell, didn't you? It was for his own good. Mr. Grisson argued. It was for all your own good. If your son had backed off and kept his nose out of this, none of us would be in this position right now. This isn't Dashiell's fault, Mom cried. You're the one who's threatening our lives. You're the one responsible for Dr. Holtz's death. And you have the gall to accuse the aliens of being monsters? They couldn't possibly be any worse than you. I did what I had to, Mr. Grisson shouted. While you are all, uh, while you're all up here playing with moon rocks, I'm trying to prevent riots on Earth and make sure we're prepared for alien invasions. Yes, I took out Dr. Holtz to ensure the safety of billions of other people. And if you're not prepared to cooperate, I'll happily do the same to you. Hey! Lars Sorgeberg suddenly appeared on the catwalk, wearing his robe, slippers, and a furious expression. What's with all the shouting? I'm trying to get back to sleep. Startled, Mr. Grisson turned to him, taking his eyes off the rest of us. Chang, military guy, right, leapt into action. He launched himself at Mr. Grisson, soaring across the 20 feet between them, quickly in the low gravity. Mr. Grisson spun for the controls to the airlock, but Chang slammed into him, knocking him off his feet. Mr. Grisson fought back, headbutting Chang with his helmet. Bam! So hard that Chang tumbled off him. But by that point, Dad and Nina had rushed to help as well. Together with Chang, they overpowered Mr. Grisson, flipping him onto his stomach and wrenching his arms behind him. Garth Grisson, Nina said, you are hereby under arrest for the murder of Dr. Ronald Holtz. As well as the attempted murders of Dashiell Gibson and Kira Howard. Sabotage, blackmail, and destruction of federal property. Okay. Oh, he's going to be a big whoopee, yes. You don't know what you're doing, Mr. Grisson snarled. Nina continued. You will be handcuffed and placed under a lock and key in the medical bay with dead Dr. Holtz, right? 
until tomorrow, after which you will be returned to earth under guard on the raptor and turned over to the proper authorities there. Mr. Grisson shouted something about the Pentagon having his back, that he wouldn't stay under lock and key for long. But I didn't hear all of it because Mom pulled me aside. You were right about Dr. Holt, she told me. He was sane after all, while Mr. Grisson was apparently the one we should have been worried about. Or should have been the one, the one we should have been worried about. I'm sorry we doubted you. I'm sure that wherever he is, Ronald is thankful for what you've done for him. What about the aliens? I asked. What happened to Dr. Holt's discovery? Mom lowered her eyes sadly. I don't know. Dr. Holtz was the only one who'd had contact. Now that he's gone, there's no proof they exist at all. Rose, Nina called. There are handcuffs in the top left drawer in my room. Could you get them? She's got handcuffs up there? That's crazy. All right. Mom broke away from me and raced up to Nina's quarters. Everyone else gathered around the airlock. Dad and Nina were pinning Mr. Grisson down while he writhed angrily and told us what fools we all were. Chang was inspecting the airlock to see if he could figure out what Mr. Grisson had done to it. Large Soberg was shouting at Nina, upset that Mr. Grisson could take the precious return seat on the rocket that one of his family members wanted. Kira and her father were off to the side, quietly watching it all. The other Moonies were pouring back out of their quarters, defying Nina's orders to see what all the commotion was about. They were in the dark this whole time, and they have no idea. I thought about what my mother had said, just said to me about Dr. Holtz's proof being gone. It seemed so wrong. Perhaps he'd left some more evidence on his phone. But if he had, it was probably destroyed, which meant it would all all remain a mystery until the aliens ever chose to make contact again. And then, suddenly, understanding dawned on me, a realization so powerful, I had to lean against the wall to study myself. Then I walked around the corner, leaving the chaos behind, looking for some privacy. The mess hall was on my left, the greenhouse on my right, as a kid, I wasn't supposed to enter the greenhouse, but I went in anyhow. All right. Um, growing food on the moon was a big priority, but it proved much harder than expected, and the plants were barely surviving. The brochures for MBA had displayed... Artist's rendering of a greenhouse so thick with plant growth that was practically a rainforest. In real life, the greenhouse looked more like the Great Plains after a drought. All around me, straggly bits of greenery struggled to survive. I sat down, looking away from the door. I focused on a few pathetic tomato plants that had yet to produce a single fruit. Hello, Dashiell. I turned around. Zan Perfonic was standing behind me. I hadn't heard her come in, but then I hadn't expected to. She seemed to read my thoughts. You were hoping to talk to me. Yes, I said. Tell me, what planet are you from? No! One last note. Thanks for taking the time to read this guide to your new home in its entirety. Hopefully you found it useful and informative. Now it's time to start your great adventure as one of the first humans to ever live on a celestial body other than, the, than Earth. Although there will be a great deal of work ahead, or school if you were a child in MBA, we at NASA would like to take this opportunity to remind you to enjoy yourself. We have taken great pains to make the base just as comfortable as your home on Earth. If not more comfortable. 
So have fun up there. Make friends with your fellow Lunar Nuts if you haven't already. Be a part of the community. Organize events. Start a book club or an amateur theater group. Or Low Gravity Square Dancing Society. Remember, Moonbase Alpha is going to be your home for a long time. The more you get involved, the better we'll be. Have a great trip, and remember, the world is watching you. We have one more chapter. We'll start that tomorrow. All right, let's look at the questions. I didn't see any. I did. So sorry. I did not see any similes, so we'll have to keep looking tomorrow. Question number two. Who sent the text to Dash? You know that. Number three, what was the last note for the people of MBA? What was the last note for the people of MBA? And that's it for this chapter. Uh, the last note was um, from the thing, remember? All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye.